All right, we are going to get started now. All right, everyone. Um, welcome to another session of Lens. I want to introduce you to our guest speaker today, uh, Daniel Bailey, also known as Mr. Bailey. Thank you so much for being here. Um, a little bit about uh, Daniel is he's an independent London based product designer and his focus is primarily in footwear design and innovation. He has collaborated with Takashi Murakami uh, to Timberland and uh, his work um, aims to challenge the standard process and approach of creating footwear. Um, he started Concept Kicks back in 2013 where he um, both curates footwear design related projects, but also operates a footwear design and innovation studio. So with that being said, I'm going to turn things over to Daniel and uh, just a little bit of housekeeping rules. Please mute your, um, uh, please mute your audio if you can. And then I'm going to give things over to Daniel and then we'll do a Q and A after um, he's done. So thank you very much. Cool. Can everybody hear me as my, my mic on again. Yeah. So yeah, thank you for the uh, for the intro, um, Hector. Just yeah, I think I appreciate you uh, kind of setting this up, and uh, it's cool to kind of chat with with some of the community and 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 share some of like you know uh, some of my insights. So um, I think kind of what I have in mind for for, for this. I mean. <clears throat> is just kind of a very like loose format. Um, just kind of, I think one thing that I find, um, you know, is really when it comes to this whole, especially independent design thing, I really don't, I still haven't figured it out. Like I'm still, I still don't know what I'm doing really, but I've, I'm at a good stage where like, you know, monetarily and the projects that I get, get to work on, I'm really excited about. Um, but it's not so much of like, this isn't so much of like a how to do it. It's more of like a, I can share my story and how I've done it. Cause it's going to be, you know, um, everyone's, um, you know, version of success and what they believe it to be is, is, is different and unique. So all I can do, I think is maybe share some of the things that I've been through and then that will contextualize, uh, some of the points that I'll make later on. So I think the best thing that I can do is kind of talk about how I've gotten to this point of being an independent designer. Um, and I kind of want to preface this whole thing with, I don't, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to say that being independent is better, and I'm, but I'm also definitely not trying to say that it's worse. I feel like, um, particularly in the footwear design industry, there's a little bit of like a, a misconception that independent designers um, generally are either designers that have worked for brands and have decided to go independent after because uh, they're disillusioned with working with big brands or they're independent because maybe they weren't good enough to work for like a Nike or, or, or whatever brands. And I kind of want to, you know, showcase that that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. Um, so I thought I would kind of just run through some of like the things that have kind of led me to the place of where I am today. Um, so I'll try and run through it fairly quickly so I can get some, some interesting points, but I think this is all good, like I said, to contextualize some of the stuff that I'll say later. Um, so I first, um, went to America, so I was, um, I'm an army brat, I was raised all over the place, but I ended up kind of getting really into basketball, which is kind of where my, kind of where my love for footwear came from. Went to America on a basketball scholarship. Um, ended up being very, very close to New York City. Um, I was actually in a, a small university called Montclair State, like literally you could see like Manhattan from the campus. Um, and while I was over there, um, I found out about uh, product design 
and it just kind of completely changed my like whole view on things right like I, I didn't even know that up until that point it, it, I don't know what, in the grand scheme of things now the whole zeitgeist of the of how everything is right now I, I don't know how easy it is to find out about product design I would assume much much easier than it than it was when I was in the university um, but I kind of stumbled into it and was very lucky so near to New York I ended up meeting um, a very very close friend of mine now uh, an independent designer called Omar Bailey, same last name, no relation. So he is basically like my brother from another mother. Um, and he um, he was an independent footwear designer. Uh, we actually met at an IDSA conference, I believe in either Boston or Philadelphia, I can't remember. But he kind of opened up my whole mind. Like I didn't even know that being an independent designer, uh, particularly of footwear, was a thing. Um, and so, you know, he kind of took me under his wing. I, well, I, I just kept, I kind of just kept on bothering him. And I, th I feel like that's kind of a thread of like this whole kind of talk is just like a constant like effort, you know, just constantly like reaching out to people, asking questions. I could give less of a shit if I'm annoying someone if I get to my final result. Um, and, I, you know, annoying in the right way. I don't want to be like annoying and I can, I can explain that difference in a, in a little while as well um but you know i think at, at the core of it it was just a, a hunger to learn more and i think omar saw that uh, we went on trips um all over the world um went to factories saw the whole process and i think that's the thing that like really kind of just opened my mind was um how many different parts of the process that i saw while i was on these trips and i knew that from um internships that i'd had previously that that's not always the case you know I, I had a very brief stint at march on eyewear eyewear in new york um where we actually um designed uh, sunglasses for i think it, it was for nike and a few other brands but that was a lot more, I, I really enjoyed it but that was a lot more siloed right like you wouldn't necessarily go to the factory or you wouldn't necessarily do a lot of the things uh that you would do if you were more of an independent consultant um, and so, you know, those trips of Omar really, really taught me a lot of things. And, and I just saw how, um, if you were smart, you could really capitalize on a, on a bunch of these different things and, and also just kind of apply your creativity to different aspects of the product. So it doesn't just have to necessarily be the aesthetics. It could be, you know, the construction, it could be, um, literally down to the product line and like, you know, can you creatively like think about how a shoe can get made in a much more efficient manner, even down to like how it's shipped? How can you save, um, you know, uh, packaging costs or just, you know, um, really just delve into the whole process. And so that kind of lit my fire um, for wanting to do the independent thing. Um, and so, you know, that was obviously massively instrumental. Um, to me being an independent. Uh, and this was all while I was in America. Um, so after that happened, there was a very big like moment in my life where basically, so I was at the time, I remember I was studying in America, came back to the UK um, and my visa had run out. So I tried to come back to America on a regular visa and they basically turned my ass around and said, no, 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 we don't want you over here. Um, entirely my own fault. But basically I couldn't come back to America. And so like I had no plan, nothing. I didn't know what I was doing. I just knew that I wanted to carry on doing what I was doing. Um, but like just fresh out of college, knowing that I wanted to kind of pursue this independent thing. Um, so like, and the reason why I think it's important to bring that up is just because I know there's a lot of graduates right now that are kind of going through this whole quarantine um, thing. And it's kind of maybe thrown a little bit of a wrench in the, in the works. Um, and the one thing that I can say is, you know, in any situation, you can, I think you can let yourself uh, um, kind of be upset for a little while, you know, for whether it's hour, an hour or, or a day. But then there has to become, there has to, what's very important is there has to be that moment where it's like, okay, so how am I going to turn this around? And so like, I've said this before, but I'm kind of always viewing my life, like how I'm going to tell this story to like my grandkids or like if there was a, if there's a film being made about it, like this is like an interesting part in that, in that narrative. And I only think I think it's only it's only like interesting when you can turn that 
perceived negative into like a like a nugget of positive right so when i got basically turned around at the border and uh escorted to a plane um i was thinking the whole time like what you know what can i do now so i basically just worked on my skills i tried to create my own brand i tried to like i just i just did whatever i could i wanted to be the best like photoshop render like anyone had ever seen i wanted to be the best sketcher i wanted to be you know i wanted to go to the factories and learn how to make shoes i wanted to just you know in those few years i kind of wanted to almost like teach i don't know the security guards at the airport a lesson um and not that they really give a shit but like you know i just wanted to kind of you know i just took that chip on my shoulder and tried to turn it into a positive um so you know throughout the whole time just um after being turned around from being over there just using that time to work on my skills get better at 3d um i had a bunch of different kind of things happen um so i'm still working with omar you know we, we've been lucky enough to work on a bunch of brands from like you know developing footwear from high heels for like new york fashion designers to making um slides for supreme to a bunch of different things and so that told me a lot and then got hit up by uh someone in belgium that wanted me to design um a jet ski concept they had um so something completely different but something i was massively into automotive design when i was in university and so that was like a dream uh and it was just me and this guy and his team of engineers in italy they were like uh they were formula 1 uh engineers and so we were just all working together to make this thing happen and so you know moved out to belgium um and learned a whole lot um you know while i was out there and just kind of like just you know went all in um didn't know anybody over there didn't speak flemish didn't speak french um but you know i just kind of threw myself into the work that was an incredible experience and that kind of led to a bunch of other things right so like after that i moved uh to a bunch of different countries and just trying to find my way all the while um you know i'd kind of been thinking about this website and bear with me if i'm kind of moving like kind of quickly here but um a website where you know because i i've been doing this jet ski thing i've been doing a few other projects but footwear design was still something that like as a product from coming from product designer mindset i just love footwear and how quickly you can go from idea to like an actual physical sample um with a jet ski right it actually never ended up happening because there's just so many things that you have there's so many barriers that you have to overcome which is which is fine don't get, don't get me wrong but if you don't if you can't spend 250,000 and not blink like not blink an eyelid it's not the right pro it's not the right like project for you to be on so what i that just kind of you know increased my fervor for footwear um and i ended up moving to well sorry i'm going to backtrack a little bit um while i was in belgium working on that jet ski i was just thinking about you know the footwear process and and how much i loved it and i'd always just thought that there wasn't enough information out there because i'd kind of locked into it right um while i was out there i actually applied when i was at university i applied for an internship at nike and they basically said they only take product designers and i was like well shit i'm out here i'm literally paying international like you know um like uh money for for to be at this school uh, i i probably should make sure that i'm on the right course and so um <clears throat> and that just they just happened to have a product design course I switched while I was there but while I was like finding all this stuff it just blew my mind how talented these designers were and so while I was in Belgium I just always thought that it needs to be something out there that kind of like silos and curates this content and can get it out to people and so that's where the kind of the idea of concept kicks for let it see and so in Belgium I was working on that jet ski project um I started concept kicks um so that kind of like um uh, just kept on evolving um I don't know if if anybody here saw the first concept kicks website but it was absolutely diabolical but it is what it is when you start right and you just you know you keep working you keep working and to be honest even right now we're working on a refresh I think it's like solely 
overdue uh, for Concept Kicks, but at the same time, like, you know, Concept Kicks has kind of turned into something that I really, really love. And it's my process that I, you know, I wake up and I look for stuff that I, that I find really inspiring. But at the same time, there's so many things happening right now. Um, and so but I'll get, I'll get more into that. So after I started, you know, Concept Kicks in Belgium, um, I ended up by way of Germany, I ended up going to London. Um, and so while I was kind of doing all this stuff um, in, you know, in between that Belgium to London move, I was consulting with brands and reaching out, trying to network. Bear in mind, this is mostly all online, right? Because I'm, you know, I've got no money. I was like, I was either in Belgium or in the middle of Germany. Um, and I was lucky enough to kind of um, consult for a few brands. Um, and so after the jet ski project, I ended up doing this, uh, this um, sandal, well, sl slipper concept called Mojave's, which is like a modular concept where you can remove the outsole um so like the idea being that when you're outside you can have this outsole on the slipper and then when you get back in you can take it off um it was a cool concept it definitely could have used i i feel a few more rounds of execution but it is what it is um and so that shoe ended up um not to not to sound like braggadocious but that ended up winning best innovation of footwear uh 2000 i believe 16 um or 15 can't remember uh from draper's magazine um and so what that did is like after the jet ski thing which like that gave me a massive boost of confidence right like um i was working on that jet ski um and i really had no idea about um you know from a nautical engineering standpoint how to build that but i worked with the with a nautical engineer um building that in 3d actually getting that prototyped and it actually you know working to a decent degree just gave me a massive amount of confidence then when that when i did this mojave's project and it won this award i was like you know what i'm designing this from my bedroom uh in the middle of nowhere in like belgium or germany and so that just gave me a bunch of confidence that like you know me doing this independently um, with, with the help of other people, like absolutely, can yield really, really good results. And so that, for my confidence level, um, was massively important. And, you know, I think like being an independent, you know, it's not necessarily, um, you definitely don't want to be co like cocky, but having a level of confidence is incredibly important. Um, so yeah, so after that, um, working on a bunch of random projects. I worked on some stuff with like General, General Electric and NASA for like, it sounds really like way crazy than it was, but it was basically just a shoe uh, to commemorate like the moon landing, which was amazing. That was, that was super fun. Um, and um, that combined with everything else, just I was like, you know what, I just, I feel like I'm at a stage now where I feel confident where I can go. I need to, I was even gonna go to move to Berlin or London. So I ended up going to London. Uh, which is where I am now to this day. Um, grant, bear in mind, I'm still a consultant. I'm still like, you know, I'm starting to gain a little bit of notoriety through the stuff that I was doing for Concept Kicks on my own stuff. Um, but I was still broke. You know what I mean? I'm like still like coming to London. I found like a basically like a shoebox to live in that was 250 pounds a month. And I had no idea whether I was going to be able to afford that. Um, but I was, I knew that that was like a gift, like 250 pounds a month in London is like, it's unheard of. Right. Um, so I ended up moving over to London and really that's where like a lot of things really took off. Um, I started to just, um, the work just kind of just started to really come in, work with like everyone from Nike to North Face to, to who have just, you know, brands that are really well respected. Um, and the momentum of everything I was doing just started, to, you know, to start to kind of exponentially get better and better. Um, and you know, meanwhile, throughout this whole process, I'm I'm being reached out to sporadically by um, you know by these larger footwear brands, um, or like seeing if I'd be interested in jobs. And um, what I kind of found was 
every six months they'd, they'd reach out like maybe you know like it was kind of like on a timeline of, of, of six months but every time I said uh, you know respectfully thank you but no because I was happy on the journey that I was on the offer that they would come back to me on uh, with six months later was way way better than the initial job they, 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 they offered me right so I was like okay so this is another like example or, or proof that I'm doing something right because six months ago they basically offered me like the lowest of the low now they're offering me a, a position that there's no way I would have gotten to if I'd have taken that position initially and so that kind of kept on happening and that just kind of gave me the that also gave me the confidence that hey I'm moving in the right direction I feel good that I'm doing my own thing um and so um being in London networking with people um I actually ended up like meeting a whole bunch of incredible people. Um, and I would say kind of where everything really started to take off um, was when I had my buddy, um, David Maudsley actually moved down and he's far more sociable than I am, right? Like I am quite happy, like during this whole quarantine, it hasn't really changed much for me. Like I'm very happy to be in my living room, like sketching, on my laptop that's very like that's i'm totally in my comfort zone um but when he moved down he's a lot more sociable than i am and we i kind of like was really interested to see how we could work together on some projects um and we ended up going out to uh linear pele fair in italy and meeting all these different designers and that, that ended up just you know just kind of utilizing you know what concept kicks had already kind of created with showcasing all these designers actually being in this place where some of these designers were um, just kind of, you know, cemented those bonds even more. And so we're out there and we're at, you know, uh, dinner and it just happens at like friggin' we're at dinner with like 20, 30, like, in, like, des like designers from all over the shop, from independent to like off-white designers to Nike to you name it, like across the board, like everyone sat at this table. And so, you know, just that like level of networking um, just really, really leveled up for me. Uh, and just kind of continuing that, you know, just thought like, all right, so this is really, in I've learned a lot from here. I've, I've learned a lot from this. Um, where else could I kind of take this? So I started going some more like Paris fashion weeks and things like that. Because the thing with like footwear design in, in particular is it is a product, but it's also it's as much a product as it is a stylish item, right? So the aesthetics of it are very important. So, you know, I don't care how well a shoe performs, no one's going to wear it if it's hideous, right? So there's this kind of like this meeting ground of these two uh, places, right? So you've got your product design, how does it work, the engineering of it, which I really love. And there's also the aesthetics, the proportions, the, you know, just the general, like the look, the material, uh, things like that in the material is definitely, you know, crosses both of those. Um, and so going over there, just meeting people, um, again, networking with the right people. Uh, and one of the times while I was over there, uh, they ended up like that, like, well, sorry. Let me just start again. So I was over there in Paris and I was net networking with all these people. And while we we're over there, you know, we're in each other's Instagram accounts, we're sharing that we're over there. Um, and because of these people, they're all working in different spaces, like I say, like Off-White and Nike or all these different brands. Um, because of who they work with, they had some really interesting people watching their stories, right? And so we're all sharing each other in each other's stories and stuff. And so this is where... Takashi Murakami, and this whole project just kind of just comes out of nowhere, and um, I kind of just took it as an opportunity as a product designer to be like, okay, so this is a shoe that has no limitations of commercialization; we can do whatever we want. And so I'm like, all right, so I'm going to do a shoe that um, really embodies what I love about 
just doing just about design because there, there's very different types of design. There's like, you know, a shoe that I would wear is very different to like a shoe that I would design that was crazy that I still love, but couldn't necessarily wear. Um, so I just wanted to create a shoe that I wouldn't necessarily wear, but was a real combination of like a complex construction method. Um, but was also, you know, kind of fun and a mixture of art, um, and, 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 and footwear. Um, and him giving us that platform, it just kind of raised everybody involved. Um, and just kind of gave us a platform to just, you know, showcase what each of us had like the capabilities to do. And so from that, again, it's just like this kind of just like exponential increase of like, all right, so you do this and then you meet these people and then you do this and then you meet these people and then you do this and you meet these people. And, you know, I can definitely say that a lot of the, the people in, in my network right now, um, they're all incredibly talented people and they all happen to be doing amazing things. Um, and what's really great about that and what I think is really important as an independent good network whenever they do something that is amazing that actually brings you up as well right so and this is the one thing that i learned from concept kicks um because one thing that i kind of um have faced recently um is because you know some people see the you know the fact that i get to do like really just kind of out there projects for the most part, I don't share too much of like the client stuff that I do or have done that is more commercial. Um, so mo most of the time it's like just these kind of creative off the wall projects. They, they look like they're a lot of fun and for the most part they definitely are. Um, and sometimes you get, um, you know, you hear there's a little bit of shade thrown your way or, you know, um, there are people that maybe other, you know, are kind of looking down on you because you you're doing like these crazy creative things. Um, and there is an element of, of jealousy in there, right? I'm not saying the jealousy of me, um, but like, I think in the industry, it is easy for people to be jealous of other people that are doing, uh, stuff that they wish that they would maybe have the opportunity to do, but their job isn't letting them do it. Right. So like, um, it's a very tricky road to go down, but the one thing that concept kicks taught me is if I ever felt like any jealousy towards someone else because a project was so good. I'm like, damn it, I wish I'd have done that. With Concept Kicks, it's very cathartic because if I ever see something that I think is amazing, I want to share it. I want to celebrate it. Um, and I only try to so, so, like um, associate with people that have a similar mindset, that get genuinely excited when someone else does something amazing and wants to share it and like, you know, uh, and let themselves be excited about it. Um, so that kind of, you know, was really instrumental to me, um, not only in just being able to reach out to people with, with, with concept kicks, it kind of, at me as an independent gives me an olive branch to reach out to people. Um, like I feel like particularly now with, uh, the way social media is, um, it's so, so, so easy to reach out to anyone at any time but it actually almost makes it more difficult, right? Because anyone can reach out to anyone at any time. So with Concept Kicks, what it gave me is, for the most part, when you're reaching out to someone, it's all about what value can they bring to me, right? But when you have something like a Concept Kicks, it's like, hey, I'm reaching out to you and I can bring value to you um, because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm I want to I want to share about what you're doing and I want to share it with you know these people this this very like focused group of people and I think it's also that's like a very interesting way to think is like you know don't be upset upset if someone doesn't get back to you because you have to think about it like you know we, we all of all of our um, relationships it should be an equal amount of give and take and so if you're constantly reaching out to someone and you constantly want to take um, you know, for the most part, I think most people in the product design industry are, pre are very good at trying to give back. I, like, I understand that. But it's also interesting to see, like, how can I add value to this person? Um, and so I think having said all that, it's kind of, 
you know, um, I've definitely been going off on a tangent and there's a ton of other things I wanted to say, but I feel like I've just been rambling anyway. Um, but I kind of wanted to just maybe um, give some tips and some maybe like some, um, just a little bit more, just give some insight into how like I'm thinking now, um, having been through this independent path that I'm still currently on and still learning a whole bunch from. Um, right now I'm in a very lucky position that, you know, I've had people reach out to me to do like really cool things. Um, and that's always nice. Um, and I had like a moment of clarity at one, I was, I was in this really, really like really fancy like hotel with these like famous designers and like freaking Yoji Yamamoto walks by me. Right. And it's just like this moment where I'm just like, what is going on and in that moment i realized that like this is cool that i'm with these guys but i don't necessarily want to be known as the guy that works or does like projects for these guys i want to do my own stuff and so like um i'm kind of in a space now where um i want to just continue to evolve and create things i think the worst thing that you can do uh, as an independent because you're so you know at the end of the day, it's, it's great to create, um, but you need a certain amount of money to live, right? You need to pay your rent, you need to do stuff. So, and you know, that, that's definitely something you want to have uh, in mind. And when you're, when you're first starting, it's important, but once you get to a level where you, you actually have a, you, you can make sure your rent is paid and you can do things. I think you need to absolutely like take advantage of that situation and just create something. They don't have to worry about it necessarily making you money straight away. Think about how that creation um, will proliferate throughout, you know, the industry, right? So like if you put it on your Instagram or you put it on your website or, or whatever, it might not necessarily get the most likes or whatever, but it, it puts, it puts your, your way of thinking out into the world. And that's one thing for me that has been like a really big game changer is I've, once I did that like whole Takashi shoe and then I did a shoe after that. And there's a few other things that I've done. Um, people want to really start like, like reaching out because they see the way that you think. And um, it's, it's something where, you know, um, I've been fortunate enough to start to work on projects that like, you know, I wish I could talk about They're super fun, super cool projects, but like, the one thing that I will always keep in mind is I just want to create what I, you know, I, I always want to keep what got me here in the first place. And that's just creating what either myself or like teaming up with other people that I think are incredible and just creating stuff that we think is awesome. And so that's where I'm at right now. I do occasional like client work for things that I think are like, you know, very, very like that, that I'm really excited about. But for the most part, I'm in a phase now where I want to independently do independent like projects or reach out and get the right people to do things um, to kind of continue that. So I've definitely been talking a lot and I just wanted to kind of like, before we get into like the Q and A, just give some actual tips. And again, I'm not telling anyone how to do this because I'm still figuring it out, but these are some things that I've kind of written down. So if you are thinking of, you know, kind of creating your own path or, doing your own thing. The first thing that I would massively like advise you to do is keep your living costs as low as possible. Um, don't worry about like timelines set by other people of like, oh, you should be married now. You should have a car. You should do this. That stuff will weigh you down really quickly. Right. Um, and honestly, the, the, the best thing that you can have as an independent is a steady income. If you can get to that, then you're doing really, really well. Um, that's something that I've, managed to get over the past maybe a couple of years but like it's taken me a long time to get there um but i will say that the growth is very very quick it can it can be kind of very it can start off quite slow but once you start making that turn it can go up pretty rapidly and this cross that continues for everybody i'm just going to touch the wood over here um again i kind of said this before be active don't be reactive what can you do? What projects can you start? Who can you reach out to? Do you see a gap in the market? Just email a brand, just email, just like if you can go and talk to someone, like if you can make a project for someone, go out and do it. 
um, this is a constant thing of this, like, it, it doesn't stop. Like, how do you continue to reach out and be uh, proactive? Um, network is everything. Uh, Concept Kicks is just as much uh, a collection of really amazing, talented people that are all first and foremost, first and foremost, good people. And everybody is incredibly talented, um, but we all kind of help each other. Um, create and then the money will come. Um, you know, there definitely has to be like a, a good balance of both of those things, but just make sure that you continue to create. Um, and the last thing is, um, I've kind of found um, my niche in the industry because of the two things that I said before, right? Like I'm at, I'm just as much a nerdy product guy. I say nerdy. I don't think product guys are necessarily nerdy, but like, um, I love that, like, you know, engineering side of products, you know, getting into the nitty gritty as much as I love the, the more like style side being in like, like a, like a, like a, you know, fashion week or whatever, or just the aesthetics of a product. I love that as much, uh, just as much. And so my niche is a lot of the times product designers are, you know, speaking one language and fashion designers are speaking another. And, you know, that's where you get like a lot, like, like a Nike basketball shoe that performs really great, but nobody's trying to wear that off court, right? Um, I kind of come in and I'm like, hey, so I understand the product side of that, but I also understand the aesthetic side of that. And that's kind of where I'm offering my unique perspective uh, and design language to brands. And that's kind of helped me. Um, and the other thing also that, I guess a last point I'll make quickly is, one thing that I've kind of um, has been said to me before is um, when brands reach out, this is actually what happened with the Mojave shoe is they had someone, an independent um, designer that was, oh no, sorry. They had a, someone that worked for a brand for, for a, quite a number of years um, and they contracted them to do the, to do the shoe. And they were very like, you know, uh, focused on what was possible right now um, within these very like tight constraints. When I, when I design, for better or for worse, I don't want to know about too many limitations when I first start. I like to get like absolutely insane, go crazy, and then I'm confident enough in my ability of like understanding shoe construction or product construction to bring that back down to a reality later. But I'd much rather go out there and see, you know, what is possible um, rather than have never like even just, you know, allowed it to get that far. Um, but yeah, I guess that's pretty much my ramblings for right now. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I think what we're gonna do now is we're going to uh, just open it up with some Q and A. And I think maybe I can kick things off with the Q and A part. Um, I did have a question I wanted to ask you. Um, when I was studying in undergrad, this was back in 2008, 2009, seems like yesterday. Um, you had a, like a, another online platform called monkey design. Yeah. <laughs> Do you, uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Monkey was what actually like gave me all the tools to do concept kicks. So, um, again, it was kind of that similar thing that I said before, right? I kind of found out about this new world of product design and I was like blown away by everything. And so I just wanted to just share all this stuff because I just felt that I just felt like it was something that I hadn't seen before. Yeah. Terrible name, terrible looking website. Um, but what I found was really important about Monkey was that like I just started to realize that from a networking standpoint, it was incredible because I would reach out to people to do interviews. And the thing is, is like once you reach out to someone, that's the contact. Like you know what I mean that it's not like you just have that initial interaction and then that's it um and so I was starting to reach out to people that I just thought were really really talented are really interesting uh having interviews with these people and then being like hey after the interview it'd be great if you you know because I was right by New York let's go meet up have a coffee uh, um and yeah that monkey is what made me realize like wow if I want to get my networking game up this is like the most awesome way to do it and it benefits everyone. It benefits the person that's being um, shown because it gives them eyes. People get to see their work. And it benefits me because I get to connect with that person um, and be surrounded and inspired by other people. I've got a side note. 
What's up, Daniel? We've never, hey, actually, up? We've never, we've never actually met. <laughs> no, what's up, man? We go, we go way back. I told Hector that. You're someone that inspired me massively. <laughs> No, I actually because you're talking about monkey design. I remember when you dropped the website, and I was like, "Shit, this is real. We got, <laughs> we got competition." And I just dialed it up. Like, so thank you. For that. Oh, amazing! No, you, I, you, I turned it up to eleven after after that drop. So, oh man, that's amazing to hear. Yeah, no, I was, dude. I was, I, I was watching your videos and everything from when I was in university. Massive inspiration. Yeah, I could I can relate to a lot of what you said about starting up and keeping it lean. That's what I'm doing right now. So yeah, appreciate all the advice, reminders. Yeah, it's mad that you're on here. <laughs> yeah, I've been I've been listening the whole time, man. Mad, mad respect. No, I appreciate it, man. Right back at you, bro. Um, so I got a question for myself. Um, sorry, Mr. Mr. Vale, a big fan of yours. I'm based in London myself. Um, nice. Oh, I'm starting up my own um brand as well. Um, I just wanted to get your perspective on, you know, obviously if you're starting up, um, is it obviously being self-aware is really important because obviously you know you know what you're good at. Um, is it also important to make sure like, you know, if I have a friend who can make a website, because obviously at the start you're almost like, if you're saying saving costs, so, you know, you know, launching on website, getting all the marketing going on Instagram, et cetera, et cetera. Um, do you always recommend, you know what I mean, if you have people, who like friends um obviously at the start you haven't got the money to like pay people so is it important to always like um you know if you can utilize your friends where possible to make so i can be the one to focus on more the you know making sure the product has been designed well etc you know absolutely man i mean like it's all about selling the dream you know what i mean mm. you have to kind of like um you know i think if i think passion is infectious and if you're really genuinely passionate about it, I think motivating other people to be a part of it shouldn't be too hard. You know, like I know that even right now, like I've just started on a new journey. I've got, um, I'm actually like launching something. Um, and I've reached out to someone that I was actually at university with when I was back in, in the States, you know, very good friend of mine. Um, I've got, um, then there's two or three, there's three people working on this with me and nothing is promised, right? And they're all professionals. They all have day jobs. Um, but I know, I know that I'm extremely, extremely excited about it. Um, and they, you know, it wasn't hard to get them excited about it. So I, I would just, yeah, I would say reach out to those people and just, you know, kind of tell them what you're envisioning. Um, mm -hmm it's massively important to just try and like you say, be lean and just, you know, just to see what you can, to see what you can do as long as you're not trying to like take advantage of anyone, you know, if I feel like as long as you're like genuine in what you want and, and they see, you know, um, some kind of return for their efforts in the future as well. As long as you're like upfront and say, Hey, like, Hey, this is a punt, right? We're trying something new here. Um, and you know, be up front like that i don't i don't see why not if they're not into it then they're not into it but then you just have to find other ways of doing it. you know what i mean definitely um sorry another question there um with regards to like the you know the footwear design process um i mean how vital is like um you know when you go from just the concept to tech sheets is that you know um how do you usually maybe this is maybe a two bit of a personal question um but like i usually use a trick of using an existing shoe to get measurements of that is that is that a convenient way to go about it or do you think absolutely man is there yeah. a better way to go about it i think as like you go from like a student student to professional you realize like all the stuff that you cared about when you're a student it doesn't matter mm -hmm. right so it's like okay. if i find a last if i see a shoe that has a silhouette that i love i'm gonna mm -hmm. buy that shoe and i'm gonna send it to the factory and be like i want this shape I'm not going to copy it by any means, like as far as the design, but like the shape, I want that. Um, absolutely do that. Uh, there's no point in like trying to recreate something that's already been, you know, created. I'm not trying to, again, not to, but like, mm -hmm. there are certain things. Um, I think it makes sense. Uh, as far as actually like going from design, like concept to tech pack, that's very, very, very important. Um, so there's two ways of kind of, you can go about it. So like, I think with renderings and things like that, I usually only render now 
um, for two reasons. One, I want to get other people excited about something. Um, so if like I have a client or whatever and I want to go in a certain direction and I feel like they're kind of maybe thinking about going somewhere else, I'll make sure that my rendering of what I want is just like as good as I can make it. Um, okay. And two, it could be because the shoe is very complex and I want to, I want to make sure that, that the factory fully understands what I'm envisioning in my mind. Um, mm -hmm. But for a lot of the stuff that I do now, um, because my whole thing about, I'm like those two years that I, those like two or three years that I took out, like when I was, when I, when I didn't, couldn't come back to America. And even when I was in America, after I like graduated and all that stuff, I was very like, I was obsessed with process and how I could be as efficient as possible. Um, and so that's still something that I'm continuously working on. Um, what I tend to do now is I'll sketch in my notepad. But then because I know what I want in my mind and I know how the factory works, I will usually go straight to Illustrator and do a line drawing because mm -hmm. I know how to call it out. And right now with the way that I deal with footwear, I know that the first sample is probably going to be terrible anyway. It usually is. Mm -hmm. So how can I get to that second sample as quickly as possible? So mm -hmm. I'll do what I have to do to get as much of you know, what I want across to get to the factory to make something that I know is probably going to be wrong that I can get in hand, sketch on the shoe, and get to that next sample, which will hopefully be on the money. Got you, got you. Um, so a last question, I mean, obviously I saw other people can jump in. Um, I was looking at, um, you know, obviously the venture I've sort of started now, a couple of friends about, um, you know, when you're starting small, um, always doing like a limited number, um, limited quantities, if you know what I'm saying. So like, Obviously, you just don't want to have like dead stock um, by the end of it. Like, obviously, you spoke about, you know, um, where there's like, you know, if you're starting on something and posting it on, you know, Instagram socials to get people's perspective um, or get them excited about something. Um, and we're talking about, you know, um, obviously, my brand as a sort of like brand equals being able to um, only do like a limited number of shoes to start with. Um, and then obviously building from that. And also like, you know, um, a friend of mine was asking about, you know, using pre-existing souls, for example, rather than like obviously developing your own. Um, is that, you know, for a, for a startup, do you recommend, you know, starting with pre-existing souls and then go on to, you know, make you making like a custom soul later on down the line? I mean, it's, I can't speak for every brand. Um, I would say from a monetary perspective, it absolutely makes sense to use pre-existing, mm -hmm. but it all depends on what your, you know, what your brand stands for. Um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, with pre-existing, if you get creative with it, you can, you can make some pretty unique soul units. I have a, mm -hmm. um, a collaboration with forever called reform where like there, yeah. there are yeah. souls available, but I only mm -hmm. like, allow certain brands to use it so it's like a the thing with pre-existing souls is like a lot of the times that brands um end up finding one that they love and it's proliferated throughout the entire industry and then it's just like kind of gets a bit boring you know what i mean yeah. uh, but you know from a cost point perspective it's, it's probably a smart thing to use pre-existing but again you know it's entirely on the brand and what what is important to you know, the brand ethos. Um, mm. I would also go to like the whole limited thing. You know, if you can, it's probably also a good idea, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't like, and this is just like my own personal opinion. I wouldn't make something limited just to make it limited, just to try and get as mm -hmm. well. Like what is the reason behind it being limited? Like if mm -hmm. it is, you know, from a sustainable standpoint, like you've got this amount of material and that's all you have to use, then fair enough. Mm -hmm. Is it like, do you know what I mean? I hate it when people just try to make things like, you know, when it's disingenuous to just try and make it like hype or whatever, like mm. there needs to be a reason behind it. But that's my own personal mm. view. Mm. That makes sense. Hey, Daniel. <laughs> hey, what's up, man? Um, can you talk to the never ending conversation of hype versus design? Because I feel like right now um, that's, that's a huge topic. It's hard, man. You know what? I mean, it's hard to not be disillusioned with it a little bit because like there are some, there are some things that like, 
I wish I could just come out and say it, but like there are some things that like you think are designed by someone that you massively respect and they had nothing to do with it, right? But because of their name association, it's just gonna make it hot. Um, I do think that there are, I think we're in a, I think we're in a pretty good phase where there are shoes that are hype that are also actually kind of, you know, being interested. I actually think what Yeezy is doing right now is actually really interesting. Um, so, and that, that doesn't get much more hype than that. Um, but I actually think from a design side of things, he's kind of using that freedom that he's been giving, given with the hype to do some really cool stuff. So I feel like it's a power that you have and it's almost like, you know, when you have this power, it come, there, there comes that, you know, this uh, responsibility. And, um, you know, for the most part, I think, I think people kind of, kind of lay on their laurels and just think, well, you know, I've got the hype behind it. I'm just going to push out a bunch of shit. And I know that, you know, these, these sneakerheads are going to buy it. But I do think there are, I do think there are, there is a good balance right now for certain brands. But it's hard, man. I mean, that's kind of like a, the game that, um i think we're all playing a little bit right like especially uh in you know obviously brands are playing with that by doing you know the collaborations that they are um and even independence right like building your own brand and kind of aligning yourself with the right brands or people i think as long as um you know i think as long as you play the game right you can kind of benefit from both of those things it's uh it's not easy to do but yeah, I don't know. It's a, it's a it's a really good question. I don't really have a great answer for it, but <laughs> I'm not a huge fan of like, you know, I think I actually made a post on Concept Kicks a while back, kind of like just saying that would, I think I think at that year, the Yeezy, uh, whatever the number is, I'm so terrible names, it won like shoe of the year. And I just said that I'm a fan of like all the stuff that's coming out, but like that shoe, if it wasn't related to Kanye, I don't think it would have won shoe of the year. You know what I mean? Um, I think, you know, what I genuinely like are things that kind of, you know, really push the industry forward as far as like whether it's a new construction technique or a new material or whatever. But I don't know if that, you know, it has to be a really good mixture of both. You have to, how do you, how do you, you know, how do you do that? How do you play both sides? That's the hardest thing. But that's the reality that we live in. And the person that can play those two worlds the best wins. Thank you, Daniel. I really appreciate your chat. Um, I just wanted to ask, how long was it from university to um, starting Concept Kicks? Um, whenever you got, kind of got turned around at the border there, um, kind of facing that um, hard time to kind of the uphill uh, kind of climb of Concept Kicks and your, your kind of journey into the sneaker world? Um, from when I got turned around at the border to starting Concept Kicks, I believe was about a year and a half i think okay. yeah so i mean it had been something that i've been thinking about for a long time i actually wanted to do it while i was in the states i talked to my buddy omar about it um the problem was i was just thinking like because originally concept kicks was actually meant to be a platform that i probably wouldn't even like put anything on except for like maybe some work or whatever it was actually meant to be a platform where designers that work for brands would post their stuff Right. So like, and obviously like at the time, you know, a little bit ignorant, I didn't know that like, you know, brands probably weren't too happy about sharing all of this stuff. Right. Um, but I thought it, there needs to be a platform where people can find out all this stuff. So my idea was to kind of like just have all these profiles from all these designers so they could just post their own stuff. Yeah. Um, obviously that didn't like work out for various reasons. Uh, and I thought, you know what, I'm just gonna do it myself. Um, and so one day when I was in Belgium, I literally just woke up and the name Concept Kicks just like pinged into my head. And then that day I started Concept Kicks. Um, and that's kind of where it all started. Awesome. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. All good. Um, I had a quick question. Um, speaking of your, your friend Omar, you were talking about, um, you mentioned earlier how you kind of like started like going to factories with him and everything just by like being annoying in the right way. Um, <laughs> yeah. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? I just thought it was, it was like a funny thing. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah, so like, I feel like people can be annoying in the wrong way, right? So, and I don't necessarily mean be annoying in the right way. I feel like it's, it's reaching out in the wrong way, right? So, um, I feel like with Omar, um, 
whenever I would kind of like ask him questions or constantly, you know, like be that annoying thing, he knew that my intent behind those questions was like, was honorable, right? I just wanted to get better. Um, but it wasn't like a selfish thing. Like I wanted to learn from him, but I wanted to also offer my services to him to make his life easier or whatever it was, right? So there was a give and take there. Um, I think when people reach out and can be annoying is when it's purely like a one-sided thing. And, and, and that's fine, don't get me wrong. Like I'm not, I'm not here looking for people to add to me in any necessarily way, but you know, there are times where like people, um, just ask a question is like, Hey, tell me where you're, tell me the factory where you make your shoes. It's like, I don't even know you. Like, <laughs> like if I tell you that I hopped on a plane to China to hop on another plane in the middle of China to get in a taxi cab for six hours to like a small farm in the middle of nowhere to find my last manufacturer, you think I'm just going to give that to you when you just, you know what I mean? I like, but then the thing is they'll ask that and then you won't reply. And then they'll be like, Oh, so you're not going to reply. I'm like, Oh, I see how it is. And then you get other people that just send you stuff and don't say anything or like uh, people that ask you to put them on. It's like, hey, bro, put me on. Or like you posted all this other stuff and my stuff is so much better. Stuff like that. You know what I mean? It's like I, I'm more for confidence and I'm more for people asking questions. And I think I just think there's a there's a, a right and a respectful way to do it. And there's a way that is just you're just going to get crickets. You know what I mean? So that's why I'm annoying in a bad way. <laughs> so I have a question actually um, to kind of go on top of that. Um, sure. I guess sometimes when you're like starting out, I don't always know how to contribute. So like I'm very eager to learn, just I don't know how to always come across in a genuine way. <laughs> um, so like, I'm just curious what you would say for people who are like maybe starting out who don't feel like they might be able to like give exactly an equal amount to like a partnership or a network opportunity, I guess. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily worry about trying to give an equal amount. I mean, you know, that's all relative, right? Like, um, so I tend to think, so I have my, my belief on what, I guess, I guess it depends on, on, on what the project is and, how, and your involvement in it. Um, but I think when it comes to good ideas, anyone can have a good idea, right? Like, I, I think like when I'm in a room with people, just because I've been doing shoes for however long it is, if I have someone else in the room, that doesn't mean that they can't come up with a better idea than me just because they haven't been in the industry for as long, right? So I think it's just having that, you know, have the confidence in yourself to be like, hey, I can have as good of an idea of an idea as anybody else in this room. You know what I mean? And whatever you're saying, don't let um, yourself like be. Don't censor yourself because you're worried about it maybe not being the correct thing, or or maybe coming off sounding like a bit silly or something. Because it doesn't matter. Because sometimes you have to say that stuff to get to that idea, right? And that's all that really matters is how do you get to the, that best idea? And so whether, like I say, whether you're a seasoned vet or you're just starting out, everyone can contribute. Um, and honestly, a lot of the times, just making yourself like available and um, just putting in the effort is more than enough. Like, and pe as long as people can see that you're, you know, you're genuinely like passionate and you know, your effort is being put in, you know, it's, all, it's all coming from a good place, I wouldn't worry about what's equal and what isn't. Yeah. Hey, uh, Daniel, thanks for talking, first of all. And I wanted to give a shout out to Montclair State University. Hey, I'm at you. Yeah, 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 I'm graduating there this semester. Nice. Um, yeah. Uh, I guess just bouncing off of what everybody else was, you know, kind of curious about, like post-university uh, connections. Um, was getting into an agency, like, important for you right out of college or university? Or was that, like, secondary and you were working on your own thing, you know, mostly? Get into an agency in what way? Like, a or like, design? yeah, like trying to get into a company, um, you know, right off the bat. Um, you know, what's funny is, um, after, um, I met Omar while I was in university, I was never really worried about working for anyone else. Um, after that, I just kind of, honestly, I, I was working on, 
um, I don't know, I, I felt like after I left university, I personally felt like I wasn't good enough to go anywhere anyway. And so I was like, during this time, I just gonna, I just want to get better and better. Um, and so while I was working on my skills, I just kept on, you know, luckily through Omar and a few other contacts that I'd made, I was getting these consulting jobs. And, it, and you know, um, I just realized that I would never get the freedom that I have right now. Um, you know, as sporadic as it was, you know, one month I'd be making more than enough to pay for everything, you know, like rent and all that stuff to another month, not knowing if I was going to be able to cover it. Right. So, um, I still loved the freedom more than I loved that security. Um, and so I never really, I know I was never really drawn to work for an agency, even though I could definitely see how that would add value. You know, I, I, it was just, I was just so excited about learning about all these different things that it just never happened for me because of the journey that I was on. Like after not getting, after being like denied from the States, I literally had to live with my mum in a, like a, in, in like in her same bedroom in London while she was training, like doing nurse training in London, like in this small ass room. You know what I mean? Like to then like moving to like to Crete, Greece in my parents' home. Like I was just, I was lucky that I had my parents to fall back on after all that happened. Right but I was in no position to be like, all right, I can just go to this place. And, you know, there are no design agencies that I know of in Crete, Greece. Like they, they, maybe there is, but I don't know. Um, so it was just always a case of just like me being in my room, working on stuff to the point where I went to Belgium and I started to see this momentum start to turn. So it, for my journey, it just never happened. But, you know, if I was to advise other people, I would say like, you know, I'd say it's probably good to get that experience. Um, you know, working in an agency, see what it's like, see what you like, see what you don't like. Um, the only thing that I would be very careful of, if you if you are thinking of doing the independent thing, um, one of the other reasons why I never worked for an agency is because I didn't want to get that stable check every month, right? I know that if I go and I work for a Nike or I go work for an Adidas or a Reebok or whatever, and I get like that nice wage in my, in my bank account every month. After a few years, it's going to be really hard for me to go out and not know where my next money is coming from. You know what I mean? That's a hard transition to make. And so part of the reason why I didn't do it was, was for that fact as well. I never wanted to kind of even know what that was like. Um, and yeah, so like I said, that, that's my journey, but that's not necessarily what I would say, you know, is the best. That's just how it worked for me. Thanks. Uh, so kind of adding to what you previously said that uh, had you been in Nike or Adidas, you would have kind of not know where your next paycheck is coming from. But as, as you slowly make progress while you're independent, how do you make sure that you don't get comfortable with things? Because you surely haven't and that's how you got to Concept Kicks. And like after that, where do you see Concept Kicks in the next five years? Like there are two questions here. Um, you know, what's funny is that, so I actually, I think it's, it's partly got to be part of your nature to want to continue to like push and do stuff. But like, I also feel like, so, um, I remember a few years ago, um, I got reached out to, uh, to work at the, um, to be like a, a concept creator or whatever the name was for, uh, for the Adidas uh, Brooklyn farm. And I was like, you know, what? I'm good. I'm, you know, I'm doing my own thing. I'm, I was, this is when I, I was starting to do a lot better and, you know, making like, money and doing projects that I quite enjoyed and all that stuff. And I was like, you know what? I'm good. I don't need, I don't need it. Thank you though, respectfully. And so like they kept on asking, they, they asked me a couple more times and I was like, you know what? maybe the easiest thing that I can do is to continue doing what I'm already doing. Uh, maybe the challenge for me was to go work for Adidas. And so I thought, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to get on this plane. I'm going to fly to Nuremberg and um, have a conversation. And obviously that, that didn't um, work out because I, I was so the, the freedom that I already had, I, I, I wasn't ever going to be comfortable with giving that up. And so um, that didn't work out, but I think it's just, you know, it's just your, it's really hard to say, 
because I can say that, you know, just don't get comfortable, but like it's sometimes you're comfortable and you don't, even, you're, you're sticking to what you know and you don't even realize that you're doing it. So um, I think it's just a case of like, you just try these methods of creating things and nothing is promised, right? Like a lot of these, a lot of these products I'm doing, I'm doing it because I just genuinely like love to create these things. Um, and off of the back of that, all this other stuff just seems to happen. Right. So like I create this like awesome, well, in, in my mind, like I really love it or whatever project. Then all these people will come in and it's like, okay, so I just spent all this energy and sometimes money on this product, on this product that had, I had no, there was no like path to a certain, you know, goal. It was just, it was literally just about creating this product. And then every time I do that, either a brand or a celebrity, whatever, like designer or whoever sees that and contacts me. And then there's this whole, there's this whole other world, whether it's like you get introduced to new projects or you just get introduced to new people. Um, and that kind of goes back before to what Nick was saying about balancing that hype and design. Like it's all kind of like interwoven into that. Um, and then, sorry, to your second question, which was, um, what was your second question? My memory is also terrible. So my second question was, where do you see Concept Kicks going in the yeah. next five or ten years? Um, well, Concept Kicks is like the, the best thing with Concept Kicks is it's kind of I don't even feel like I, I so I you know I I curate Concept Kicks and I, I'm the one who puts the stuff on there like every day. It's part of my process, um, and that's kind of where it's been. And I almost feel like perhaps it's been held back because of that. But the thing that I love about Concept Kicks is it is I don't give a shit about like putting anything hype on there or whatever. I literally, if I like it, it goes up. I don't care if it's going to get five likes or five, like 50,000 likes. It is what it is. It's generally just like stuff that I love. And I'm okay with just keeping it like that. It might evolve from an aesthetic standpoint. Um, it's probably going to be a little bit of a rebrand, but like aside from that actual side of curating like projects and stuff, um, I do love the fact that there is like the concept kits contributors and there are other people that come in and they always give like a really interesting insight into what they're doing. So there might be more of that. Um, and just kind of growing that community and seeing how that can kind of like, in, like just, you know, inform the language. I think it will probably go into more of like a long form article type uh, place, like on the actual website. And then the Instagram will be more for like those kind of quick hits of like interesting inspiration. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just more about like, I think I definitely, it's definitely going to grow in what direction I don't really know yet. I'm being very, I'm letting it kind of grow quite organically. Um, because for me, it's my, like, it's just kind of like my inspiration board for right now. And I don't want that to get tainted in any way. Hey, Daniel. Hi, Daniel. Okay. You can go? <laughs> Sorry, I'll go. Um, as an independent, uh, how do you balance like your skills and your and your time? Because like say Nike, they have you know concept designers and they have CMF and they have CAD. So how do you as like an independent shoe designer kind of dictate what your uh, time goes towards? As far as like developing like which skills? Yeah, skills and then time like within the project. But yeah, yeah, I guess mainly maybe more skills. Um, that's a good question. Um, I think the strongest, I mean, I can only speak from my own kind of like experience, right? But like, I think um, it all kind of is derived from like experiences that I'm really lucky, that I'm in a really lucky position to be in that, you know, um, me and my network have kind of put ourselves in. So uh, the experiences of like, you know, like I say, going to these events, uh, like, like the fashion weeks, but also going into like the linear, linear Pele's and seeing what materials are there and making these contacts. Like, you know, I go, I'm like, I'm friends of a lot of the people at these brands, right? And I go and I meet with these people and um, it's a constant, just like, because it's a passion, because, it's 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 my life right like um some people have like work and life i mean it just i don't right it's 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 really just my life is what i do and so 
that kind of mixed boundaries of like people that are in the industry that I have conversations with. Um, I'm talking to them as friends, right? But they also happen to be directors of companies that are doing amazing things, right? So um, having these conversations with brands, un like knowing about material compounds that are coming out, knowing about whatever else it is or understanding trends that are coming out or knowing like um, whoever these people are puts me in a really unique position to have a really like unique perspective. Um, but then also from a design skill standpoint, it's just a personal journey to continue to just get like, I wouldn't even say better just to change, right. Just to uh, evolve. Um, and I feel like nobody, nobody really knows the best way of doing that because everyone is so everyone's unique. So I don't know. I think it's just, um, having the confidence to understand that. All right. So I might be, you know, uh, by myself or whatever, but I know that my network of, 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 of other independents or people that I know that work in brands, like I'm heading in the right direction. And uh, sometimes when you're on the outside, you can see a little bit more clearly uh, than when you're on the inside. I mean, I hear all the time from people that work in brands, sometimes you just need someone that, you know, hasn't been smelling their own farts for like the past 10 years. You know what I mean? And that tends to happen a lot. Um, I think a really good example is, so some, I mean, every project is different, right? So sometimes someone will reach out uh, from a design side of things, right? Um, now, because Concept Kicks and my own kind of name or whatever, uh, becoming a little bit more prevalent, sometimes there's like, they want to talk about collaboration. So there's like, I, I bring them value to a certain demographic or whatever, and they bring a certain value to me because of whatever. So there's that side of things. But I think, you know, um, depending on what they're after, sometimes they would want just my advice on what I'm seeing from a trend standpoint, right? I don't even really give a shit about trends, but because of the experiences, because I'm around these people, because I see these things, it's all value to these brands. And just an outside perspective, um, with Construct 10061 that I did with Timberland, um, that wasn't even about, I mean, it's not about me at all. That's all about like, who do I find interesting that could come in and create um, within a brand that already has super duper talented designers, but they don't necessarily have the opportunity to display their true like creativity. Right. So it's, I guess my answer to your question is just like, I just bring like my network, my, my, my experiences. And, um, for right now that tends to be enough. <laughs> right. You're saying like your, your skill set and your experiences are, are very unique compared to all the other, you know, in-house creatives or whatnot. Yeah. I just think it's different. You know yeah. what I mean? I mean, their experience is different because they've, they've been in the, they've been the brand, they know what's up. Um, and you know, I think a lot of the times, so for me, like being in this kind of like, more independent space or having this creative freedom. I've never really had to worry about being siloed into something in particular. So I don't, I wouldn't even know how to operate in that. Right. Um, and I think that, you know, there's a lot of skill involved in being able to design a shoe for a certain demographic for a certain price point. I've never necessarily had to do that on a level of someone that works at say like at Timberland. Right. And they have to design a shoe for this price point for these people. But what I bring is I almost bring, so, and, and again, it depends on what the design project is, but like with them, with constructors, I, I bring an excuse to just go fucking insane, right? Which is for the most part, people are so, you know, um, shackled. They don't get to kind of let their wings, you know, fly. And I'm just kind of like here to, that's all I do is just have fun and, and create. And I'm lucky to be in a position that people want to either help, like hire me to, you know, do designs or, or, you know, do these construct projects or collaborate. Um, and also be in a position to where I can create my own projects now as well. Cool. Thank you. No problem. Hi, Daniel. And you mentioned before that you wanted to get better at everything when you couldn't get back to the States. And I feel like that, like a bit, overwhelming when you are looking where to go as a professional did you realize that you have to focus on certain things to get better yeah i mean it was always um it was always kind of focused on different aspects so 
Um, it wasn't like I was trying to work on everything all at once. It was, you know, when I was at university, uh, I was taught SolidWorks. So I became obsessed with SolidWorks um, and was just trying to create all this crazy, as much like the most ridiculous things that I could, I would just try to. Um, and of course, before that, when I first got into, I was always into sketching anyway. Um, but I think when, I guess I should have maybe prefaced it as well. Like when I meant, like when I left and I wanted to become the best or whatever, um, what I found was all of these kind of tools that I had learned. And this is the reason why now, like for me, I've found, um, even though I still love to design different things, um, I focused on footwear because I think there are special types of like skills that are related to footwear. Um, so like the rendering that you have to do in Photoshop there's not too many other industries that would really be, you know what I mean? That you'd have to go to that extent with, like there are certain things that are particular to footwear. Um, I think the other one is maybe like, you know, there are other industries where rendering is super duper important, but I just found that like the process of footwear was quite unique. Um, and then also 3d, right? So with 3d modeling, uh, with a sole being more hard modeling and the upper being soft, there was different, it was a different thing for me. Like I'd learned SolidWorks this whole time, uh, which isn't necessarily like the best 3D modeling program for footwear, right? So I just started, started to think like, how could I mesh maybe two different, uh, two different programs together? Um, and so it was more of me trying to be the best like shoe, like footwear focused like design. And, you know, um, I actually started to look at like, even though I was trying to focus on footwear, I like I kind of like ironically looked at designers that were designing in other industries. So one of my favorite designers is uh, Daniel Simon. And so what I found, what really like fascinated me about him was he would go from, I think I remember seeing an interview where he said he would go from like initial ideation to like an actual like decently finished rendering in like 24 hours because the demands of like being on a movie set was so ridiculous and so I was like wow I mean that's incredible because I mean if you know Daniel, si Daniel Simon's work it's like otherworldly right so to think about him doing that in such a short space of time um, was just ridiculous to me so um, and not that like you know doing something quick makes something better it doesn't matter how long it takes necessarily but I was just always interested in how could I just work on my process to be as efficient as I can. So that's why it's, it's constantly ever changing. So, you know, it, during that time it, it was rendering, it was 3d modeling, it was sketching, but it was more of like, how do I work on my process to get what I have in here down on a paper or onto a computer for someone else to see what I have in my mind. Um, so it was more of just like, it, it was that it wasn't necessarily certain programs it wasn't necessarily just sketching or just this. It was like, how do I get my ideas for someone else to see and to make so I can make this thing a reality? Uh, working now with Nike and other big brands, uh, do you still need to 3D model anything or you just sketch and another person will 3D model for you or make the part? Uh, yeah, pretty much right now. From Brazil. Hey, <laughs> I, was, I was just in Brazil. I mean, obviously, really? the whole quarantine and stuff. Yeah, literally just before we're all like locked off. Yeah, yeah. Um, beautiful country. Uh, Thank you. I was, um, yeah, I mean, to be honest, right now, I don't do much 3D um, because, again, just trying to be as efficient as I can with the process. Like, what I, I have people um, that are just much faster and much better than I am at doing it, quite frankly, as much as I love it. Um, I know that I am good enough to lay it out in a way, in a, in a quite a quick way to get what I need done, uh, made in 3D, send it to those guys and they'll just freaking just smash it. So, um, but you know, it took me a long time to realize that, you know, what was my thing that I need to do and, and it's fine. You know, if I want to do 3D, I can still do 3D. Um, but, for, for right now, because there's, you know, a lot of different things happening. It's just for, for, for literally just for like workflow and getting like shit done. I need to have help with certain things. So Daniel, I think we're going to uh, probably 
get one more question and then we can kind of wrap this up. So if anyone else has one more question, if you want to come forward. Uh, hi, Daniel, how are you? So my question is uh, like when you're like when you're designing a new shoes, it's basically a canvas where you can work as much and explore as much as you want. But then how do you understand that uh, like this shoe that I have designed is ready to go into the market and is ready to get manufactured? Like how, where is that end point? That's a great question, man. Um, it's hard. I mean, it's never going to be perfect. You know, um, I think you just have to get it to a level where you're just, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's probably going to be different for every shoe you, you ever do. Um, and it also depends, you know, um, what the shoe is for and who it's for. You know, sometimes you'll, you'll be lucky sometimes to have that choice of when it comes out. Because for the most part, if you're designing for someone else, they're making that choice for you, right? Um, for me personally, um, I think there has to come that point where there's a realization of like, all right, so now I'm, I'm on my like third or fourth shoe uh, sample now. Um, I need to, you know, it's a really hard thing to like answer. You know what I mean? Because like there, there are some things where like, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you a quick story. So like the shoe that I did with Takashi Murakami, I don't know, I don't know if anyone's seen it, but it's this octopus shoe that wraps up around the side. It's a pretty crazy outsole. Um, I didn't see that sample in real life until I got to LA and had to display it in front of Takashi Murakami. So I didn't have a choice when that shoe was ready. It was the timelines of it went so, so, so quickly. Like literally that shoe we made, like we made in like maybe four and a half months, um, which if you know anything about shoe development is incredibly quick to like get to a shoe that has everything that was on that uh, finished. So sometimes you don't have a choice. Sometimes that shit is just going to come out. Um, but I also think that you have to have an understanding that your, what you have in your mind isn't always, it's not, it's not going to live up to that every single time. Um, and it's just making that choice that's like, all right, it's good enough right now to go, to go out there. Um, but again, you know, it's, um, it's entirely speculative because I know if I'm bringing out something that has my name on it, I'm going to make sure I can get it damn near as perfect as I possibly can. If I'm, if it's for, for a big brand that's trying to get something out and they're trying to make money on this and there's deadlines, then you get to a certain point. You're like, it's good enough. Let's go. Um, and at the same time as well, even if it does have your own name, name on it, it's still never going to be perfect. It's just understanding, um, kind of trying to take a step back and, understanding it's not going to be perfect but for right now it's good enough and i can always iterate and make it better for the second round cool. thanks for answering no problem. all right daniel um thank you so much for being a part of our our lens episodes um and you know your insights and all that is extremely helpful and much appreciate much appreciated um, thank you for everyone for being a part of this. Uh, we're very excited to have, you know, Mr. Bailey be a part of, of this interesting experiment. Um, this recording will be put on our website very soon. So uh, be on the lookout for that and uh, have a great weekend. And also happy Mother's Day for those who are celebrating. Take care. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks, Daniel. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys.